So episode five of the KC Digital podcast. Today I've got somebody a little bit left field as opposed to some of my other guests that I've had on. Um, Tom McDermott is an author, writer, journalist, coach who works in communication. Um, our paths crossed a couple of years ago um, and since then I've stayed quite close to him. Um, he's basically gone into football journalism from kind of more of a traditional marketing angle I think he's got some great stories to tell. Um, he's managed to grow his own following um, to a significant level through social media. Um, he also has his own podcast, which is called The United End. And then he's also got a book out there, um, which is called The Quest for Glory, which is available on Amazon. And all around, he is just a very entertaining and knowledgeable chap when it comes to football, sports writing, and lots of other things as well. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I did a podcast at the World Cup last year. I was in Manchester and I was chatting to Sky, uh, Chris Scudder from Sky Sports News and he was walking around a square in uh, somewhere in Russia. I'll say Moscow, but it was definitely Russia. Like Red and Square it, or something? Yeah, that was right. Yeah, And he, he kept bumping into other journalists and you couldn't have planned it any better. So big shout out to Anchor, actually, because it's a very good tool. Do you use it for yours? I don't use it for mine, but I have used it when I've been with other journalists who have, who have clocked in remote, remotely. So Ed Draper, um, another journalist, Sky Sports News journalist, yeah, yeah. I know he uses it quite a lot. And um, I've done a few with Paul Parker um, in, in this way. So I, it's definitely a goer. The only issue, and I don't know what it, how it works for you guys, is um, there's an editing issue in terms of it doesn't quite let you top and tail it and things. But um, certainly for getting some raw podcast material um yeah it's absolutely bob on well you know me mate nothing but the best um, nothing but the best are we on this are we doing this is this it yeah. this is it this well, is it I, I, to, to be honest with you i don't think i think because i just want it to be as raw as possible yeah, yeah. it's it's gonna be like me and you mate a bit rough around the edges but you know good, mate. <laughs> hopefully there'll be something decent in yeah, there yeah, so, mate. yeah, yeah it's good. um so, so what what got you doing I, these then what got because it's definitely something you should be doing with your sort of profiling did you, yeah. what, what made you what made you want to do it? Well, I, I tried it early on in the year, and it was um, I, I just thought podcast was going to be massive this year, um, and I, I started my first one in I think it was January or February, and I, I was actually driving in my car at the time, and I just thought, oh well, screw it, I'll just try it. I I, I had meetings in London, you know, in the London office, mm-hmm. and I met about four or five retail businesses in one day. And we're all talking about the same thing about what's going on this year and what we can see happening and this, that and the other. And I just thought, if I could record that conversation and put it out there, I would. Um, and yeah. because I just thought the next day as I was driving into work, I thought, sack it, I'll just record it. I heard about this Anchor app and, and I just thought, I'll just do it. And I put it out there. And then I did a second one, which was basically to say how I did the first one because I blagged the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then since then, what I've done is I've kind of taken one step back and said, well, what I need is... I need to talk to other people, you know, people in my network, people I know, mm. uh, people I've met over the years to then basically make it more conversational. Um, and right. yeah, it's the, the whole point behind it, to be honest with you, is to tell the story of the person I'm talking to, have uh-huh. a bit of a, a chat, a bit of a giggle along the way. And yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do um, 10 in total. So this is number five of, of the 10. Brilliant. Brilliant. No, that's good. Mate. So yeah, I think we podcasted as well. Though. I know we'll probably come on to this in a minute, but, I'm speaking to people about it, and I think one of the things is people get, you know, bogged down by audio quality, and, and not everybody could afford to to get themselves in a studio and do it. But also, secondly, you, you know, if you if you see somebody who can add value to what you're doing, or you think they're worth speaking to, actually, then pinning them down and trying to re meet them again and say, look, you fancy popping into my studio or doing it over the phone? Whereas you've got apps like this, you can just do it there and then. Yeah, I think, don't be wrong, I think it's like a lot of content, you know, when people talk, describe content, I think people get a bit precious about it, and we're in, mm. we're in, you know, we're definitely in the age of a bit of DIY content, you yeah, know, yeah. that's what you see on Instagram, that's what you see a lot out there, and it's more authentic, it's it's better from a agility perspective, because um, I'm sat in the wonderful U space now, you might see my Instagram story, yeah, I'm sat yeah. in U space in a little greenhouse, which is brilliant, but I recorded the first one in my car while I was driving, which is probably yeah. illegal. 
um, but yeah, <laughs> I, just, I just thought I've got to do it. You know what it's like. Please listen to this, do you? Yeah. Well, I might take that bit out for uh, no. legal reasons, but uh... no, no, it's all good, mate. I know. I saw you drive past me with a headset on. I know it was all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. All right. We'll get started. Do this, man. Just do so, it. So, um, for anybody that doesn't know who Mr. Tom McDermott is, do you want to just give us a quick two minutes on on you know who you are? What you're up to? So, um, I, I guess place. Well, first of all, I know Paul because I worked with him uh, an agency called Photolink, which I believe is now 77. Is that right? Yes, it is. Get the brand name right, mate. Come Get on. that in there, mate. So, 77. Um, <laughs> and I, prior to that, I did four or five years, maybe even six years, Sky Sports, Sky News, Sporting Life, um, working uh, Sky that's, um, working on the Sky Network of, of covering football primarily Premier League football and European football. And then through that, I wanted to combine sort of what I did in the football world, if you like, in the digital side of things and, and building up social, a social platform. We're yeah. working with businesses, just either businesses directly or businesses by people like Botolink, by, by our agency, 77 who they are now. I'll, I'll, I'll stop making that mistake. Um, but yeah, we, the idea was to combine the, the digital storytelling and um, being competent across as many forms as possible in the digital sphere and then applying it not only to the football world, but then hopefully to the business world as well, which I, I kind of split my time at the moment, I guess 60, 60% of sport and football and, and writing books and things like that. And then the, the additional 40, um, working with people in the, in the B2B and the B2B, B2C sector. So, so when in, you, in a snapshot, you, that's about you, it, mate. Yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, it pretty much sums up the conversation that we've had historically, but also, um, you know a lot of the stuff that you've been doing. You've you've been doing a lot of stuff on your own as well, which we'll touch on uh-huh. later. But I think it's I think it's really cool what you've been doing, uh, and seeing it from the outside looking in, um, you know, it's an interesting story to tell because I think there's me, probably more people. What you about? You were with me. You 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 you, you were like you stacked me on the on the on the late mate and just pushed me off. And yeah, me, help me on my way. Well, I think that's what it's about. Though. I think yeah, it's networking. It's... It, I think it's people knowing people, and that's one of the things. Yeah. I, um, I think I struggled with it at first because my mind isn't business or salesy, if you like. Um, it's very much sport and, like I said, been the best I could be in, from digital. So not in your sphere because you're very specialist and very good at what you do, but in terms of writing, social media, can you do a podcast? Is he good um, in front of the camera? Can you go on the radio? So when I say digital, I should probably clear that's the kind of thing I mean, social media, that kind of own things. And then once I'd sort of, could be and you know, obviously you, there's nobody's mastered it else we'd all be somebody would be very very rich but once you get to the point of where you've done that i then thought well hang on a second there's so many companies and businesses and different um people in different specialist areas that need this as well can i sort of take what i've learnt, picked up there and then apply it to to the business world if you like so that's why it was good working with people like yourself and john wally as well another good guy at yeah. 77 to work with because picking things and learning things from these people like yourself, that's one of the things I've always tried to do. You just learn. I'm not the best at anything. Absolutely not. But yeah. you've got to learn and take things in from other people. And I think football-wise, I've always had strong opinions and probably thought I'm not the best, but certainly in the business world, um, like a fish out of water, you know, initially anyway. And then that's when you when you meet people. And as you say, your network comes into play. I think, I think obviously, a lot of where I'm at today is because of the people who I've worked with. You know, I, I'm, I'm by, by no means, you know, a, you know, a genius or anything like that. I can't even do, you know, I always say, always mm. say, I'm like, I don't really know what I actually do. All I do is listen to the people around me and try and help people make good decisions. And that, I think that's pretty much it. Might be downplaying it, but it's the truth, you know. And I think when you speak to people who are like a create, you know, like those, you know, like you work with some of the creators over here and yeah. you see some of the stuff they can do. And it's just like unbelievable, really, you know, the creativity and the level and the standard that those guys work towards. Completely. However, when, when I come into, you know, what are the types of things that I can do? Well, I can help try and connect people, help try and, you know, communicate some of the things that other people are trying to do. And, and I think that that's where, you know, people like me and you can, can, add value to either Absolutely. sports businesses individuals whatever it might be so um what you know because is it because obviously should, let's just go uh, take one step back to the beginning when yeah. when you look at kind of when you were first starting out and first getting into it like mm-hmm. what, what did you did you do it at uni or anything like that or yeah so 
my twenties were I got an initial degree, a law and marketing degree in I think sort of two thousand two. Um and then like so many people in the twenties didn't really know what I wanted to do. So yeah. So it's did my turn to playing football a little bit. Um didn't really have the I guess the right attitude or the application to do that. I was always more concerned with going out and enjoying myself, drinking, living the university life, that kind of thing. And then after that, I kind of got several jobs, or probably more than that. It's a bit of a family joke in my house. I mean, just jobs I did. So I went from job <laughs> to job to job to job to job. Um, and so and on. Eventually, yeah, when I was about 27, I thought, I can't play football anymore. Why don't I try and talk about it and talk about it at a high level? And all of a sudden, things started coming a bit clearer. So I did an MA in broadcast journalism at Sheffield University. And from there, I got into Sky News, and that's where it started growing from then. So I'm 38 in January, and I've probably been doing this now for about 11 years. But prior to that, it took a while for me to to kind of fall into the to where I wanted to be. And, yeah. And I found a direction, I guess, of what I wanted to do. And I just sort of kind of stumbled across it, really. And that's what I mean when I say being as competent in as many areas. Because I was going, of course, I've got people that are on my course that are now, you know, coming out of trenches in Syria, facing for the BBC, um, building podcasts to millions of people. There, there was a quite a talented lot, and I wouldn't by any means sound as talented as them, but what I wanted to do is be quite as, I guess, as good in as many areas as I possibly could, so then it makes me more of an asset to somebody rather than saying, oh, I can do a bit of copywriting or I can do a podcast for you or whatever, try and do as much as I can to the best of my ability, and that is kind of what, what I'm still doing, I guess, as well. I'm still trying to refine, because you, you never master it. You're always trying to pick things up as you go along. That's yeah, why this is good. I think that's why it's good, like working. Got about people there, and networks, and what I found with it is, first of all, we just talk about you and John yeah. Wally at um, seventy-seven. Yeah, like, obviously very good at what you do and things like that. But nice people as well, and good people. And I think that's important because there's a lot of you know people who can say they can do things and can't do it. But I think people like yourselves and another friend of who we both know, Andy Sweet, another he's very good at what he does as well. But he's works in the digital sphere and he's also a good guy as well and that's important yeah, I think as well. Big time. Yeah, I mean he I knew sweet thing to get a mention by the way. <laughs> <coughs> um, he's, sat, he's sat here with a gun next to me. Yeah, I was gonna say he's already <laughs> sent me a You know what I mean? Of... I know you, you get people you'll have met them and Yeah absolutely I don't know if it's just so, but you, you, there's there's there'll be people in, in any walk of life, there's anything whether it's family and you get people you, you're not sure about them. But actually the, if you can trust somebody in you think they're a good person, and that goes far as well. And I think the people I mentioned, like yourself and John and Andy, I think that's that shines through. That really, if, you, if you're a good person, yes, you've got to be able to do the job. Yes, you've got to be able to do it well. But I think good people um, are important as well because people go, it's people to people, and probably, yeah. do you know what it is? It, pro- it, it it probably is, and I think that goes for, for me in my um, career as well. So, for, from from a journalistic point of view, when I was given initially sort of a month or three and a half weeks at Sky News in London, I was there for. I don't know if there was 21 days available. I was there for 20 of them. You know, they had to drag me out of there. I wasn't going to leave until I got a freelance contract. Yeah, which I eventually did. But part of it's been a bit more, a bit more human, isn't it? As well, Dan Walker said, the guy who presents Football Focus, he said to me, he said, if you go to work experience, he said, make sure you make a good brew. And if you make a good brew, make it the best one you've got because they'll remember you then. And it's little things yeah. like just be, just be, just be decent. So, yeah. um, just that really. Not really. Yeah. I think, um, well, that's that's how, obviously, when I first met you, I, I, I knew a guy called Jamie from when I was at Bet Fred. Do you remember? And, and that was a guy that you knew as well. But I think oh, that's Watson. a, yeah, Jamie Watson, he's a, he's a, he was a good lad. And, and I think that, guy. yeah, I think I think you just meet these people on the way. And I think it's good advice to anybody who's looking to get into any form of journalism. doesn't matter if it's sports or anything mm-hmm. else. You've got to treat people, you know, you've got to treat people with respect. You've got to network. You've got to really, it's the same in the digital space. You've got to work your ass off really to actually sure. put the time and effort in if you want to make it a success because the social, you know, social media is essentially people to people, but at scale. So I think yeah. a lot of the, the conversations that I've had over the years, when you're looking at who can you have a conversation with, how can you improve, how can you go on to the next level or even get your foot in the door, you know, it's often about people. So I think that's, a, I think that's a good kind of initial point to pick up. Um, in terms of like your split then, in terms of, you know, how you're you're working at the moment, how often are you writing? How often are you speaking? How often are you on video? I'm just, I just think it'd be interesting yeah. for people getting so, into the industry, what the split looks like. So for a couple of days a week, I do work with um, an agency over in Leeds. 
pretty much similar to what I was kind of doing at 77, but that's working with clients in the B2B and B2C sector. And then apart yeah. from that, aside from that, the rest of my time, I'm sort of guest lecturing. So last week I was in Falmouth the Monday and Tuesday of last week. I did two guest lectures and then I had sort of an audience. I guess like it's a bit of a Q&A where a guy interviewed me on stage in front of a, well, yeah, a live audience. Uh, and yeah. they asked questions at the end. I've got an ongoing column with The Sun where I do two articles a week for them. So after this, I've got to do a piece on Marcus Rashford. Um, okay. so, the line, so the line today is Marcus Rashford, his stats in, in comparison to Ronaldo at the similar age and also how yeah. he gets on with, uh, in comparison to Salah and Mane who were, you know, lauded quite right of everybody. But actually, if you look at the stats this season, Rashford is as good and in some respects even better than, in, you know, from a goals and assist point of view. And I think, <coughs> I think Salah or Mane are one of them and he's level with the other one. So I'm doing a piece on that. And then going into next week, there's two types of content for me. There's planned content that you can diarise. That could be around games. That could be around business targets. That could be around what you want to do yourself. And that's yeah. what I try to do. But the main thing for me and where I think the value is at the moment is the reactive content. So reacting yes. to things that, that, have, that aren't planned. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about storytelling in a minute. But, you know, if there's a racism in the game, it's quite a big thing at the moment. So I did a couple of things on racism, trying to quite closely with Troy Townsend, who's the head of Kick It Out. And these are the things you can't plan for. And I think that's the art, if you like, mastering how you respond and how you get it out through the right sort of uh, mediums when something reactive breaks. Because it's all very well to repeat a story that's happened either be it business, sport, football, whatever. But if it's actually, if you're then bringing a story on and telling the next angle in a reactive way and doing it in a way that's interesting and informative to people, then I think that's the winner. Yeah, I, th- I completely agree with that. Mate. And I think that, particularly for someone who consumes a lot of content from a sports perspective, you know, I, I do mm-hmm. um, not only from specifically around United, but I also like listen to other, con- you know, other sports. Like I listen to, you know, around, around the NFL uh, mm-hmm. podcast and some other, you know, some other sports. And I, and I think Are it's quite right? interesting. Do sport, yeah. The, around the NFL is one of the most popular podcasts on right. Apple, I've heard of Apple it, but podcasts. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. I, 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 your opinion, because you, you've got to know the game kind of thing, though. You've got to be in because I'm quite into me NFL, um, so I'm I've got me fantasy fantasy team going on over there. Right, um, they do all with, that, yeah, they? yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of people in a league and stuff, and it's a different format to the fantasy football, but I'm still boxing it either way. Any um, home, any home you know, runs this year? Yeah, well, <laughs> more touchdowns, pal. But... I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get in the hole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, I think I think you're absolutely right in what you're saying though. When when you look at how people are consuming content, there's just to be honest with you, even even like the piece about Marcus Rashford, when you see that video of Ronaldo pinging one in the top bin and then and then um obviously Rashford just doing it against Chelsea more recently, um, it does draw up that comparison. Whereas before then it was all about is Rashford a number nine or a number ten or a wide player? And to be honest with you, they've had that conversation's been over and over again. I think looking at what the future of you know what his stats are today and then what the future of the conversation might be is great what go, what's going on from a racism and inclusion perspective i think anything that's reactive just feels a bit more genuine a bit more real and something that you yeah. you know if you've not got time to prepare for it um you know often like this podcast yeah, <laughs> you, get, you know it's, it's, it's off the cuff it, but it's conversational asked, i mean that's some different questions it's good yeah it's yeah. conversational though and i think I think that's the kind of content that I like to consume. It's also the type of content that I, if I'm going to put anything out there, I'd rather it be like that because planning it and structuring it, it just mm-hmm. feels a bit corporate and a bit we're in, forced, Yeah, whereas... I mean, we're in a space as well where we need to be careful with things because um, pre-Russia World Cup last year, everything I heard was negative, hooliganism, um, question marks over the culture, fan violence, stadium facilities, um, infrastructure would the fans be looked after in terms of getting them on, not, not so much the, the trouble, but um, getting in and out of cities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything surrounding the Russian World Cup was negative. But then actually, if you speak to somebody that went there to the World Cup, lived through the tournament, travelled around yeah. the country, saw the game, saw how they were treated, the quality of stadium, the way of life, it was probably the best one there's ever been. Yeah, transport links yeah, and all that kind we of go stuff. Back, exactly, but if we go back 12 months, me and you were probably... Having a different conversation, and I, I was guilty as well. I got led down the way of guys who could be terrible, but actually, <laughs> we look back now, and the the story is what what a success it, it was. You know, 
Um, yeah, on and off the pitch, definitely. Absolutely. Um, so you know, like um, the different you're you're putting out lots of different things, which will um, we'll we'll discuss as we go along. The first one I wanted to discuss was your podcast because mm-hmm. I think you were the first person that I knew that like within who I know to actually put a podcast out there. I remember when you started the United End. It was how long ago? Was it? it was about two years. Yeah, two or three, maybe two or three years ago now. Um, yeah, it's difficult because you go in with an idea of how you want it to be and how it to sound, and then it can get taken off in different directions. I think the idea with the United end was I gained a reasonable following on social media, and instead of doing, I don't know, 180 characters or whatever it is on on Twitter, I thought the first one was, well, I'll expand by so they actually hear me saying things, and I can do sort of five to ten minute bite-sized chunks about my opinion, um, and then possibly get people in. What it sort of expanded into is getting other fans involved, former players, uh, celebrities, getting them on to whenever possible to discuss United because that's what yeah. we all love is the United fan. And, and I know you have, and I'm a United fan, and I've never hidden from that. But the fact is that we all love United and United, one of the biggest, if not the biggest club in the world, even if they're doing badly or not as good as they should be as they are now, there's always something to talk about. You know, there's all, you said Rashford there two weeks ago, it was, you know, I think somebody went today, he's gone from Trashford to Rashford. You know, yeah. it's like that kind of thing It's it's, there's always something to talk about. And I just thought, actually, I wanted to do it a little bit differently um, to what other people have done out there. And I think the next sort of phase for, for the United End is to get it more visual in vision and get people in on it and, and, and let people see, but in a different way to sort of full-time Devils and Arsenal fan TV and more sort of, I don't know, tactical look at things. And that's the idea. Yeah. And that's always the aim initially and in, in the direction I'd like to take it. But again, it's... Uh, it, it, it's time, but it's got. He's built. He's built it to a point now where, when I write for the for the Sun or some of the other places, places that I write in, I go in now as the United End editor, not as Tom at Derby Football Journalist. So that's quite nice that he's got a bit of a platform and, and people see it for for that as well. But and and that'll obviously be the ongoing. That is that is that going to be the brand that you kind of attach yourself to uh, when you're talking about United? Is that is that going to be how I think you so? Yeah, I think it's, it's not really something I thought of. It just sort of happened. I just sort of I didn't think that I'd be, I would be going into national publications or whatever as United and ready to um, being a member of the Football Writers Association and, and working where I worked before as freelance and, and continue to do so. That was always something that people went in on. But actually, I don't mind <laughs> going in as United and ready to because. It's something I've kind of created myself. The idea was mine, and then people recognise it. Um, and it's, I guess, a, a unique voice. There's a lot of shouting and opinion there, but I think because of some of the sort of links with the club I've got, and fortunate to, to know some of the coaches and people that work there, yeah, it does have a a, a unique a unique ish voice, and, and gives us gives us something to talk about in hopefully a unique way. But it's um. We, we, yeah, we're going through a bit of a revamp at the moment and hopefully it'll be more visual in the sort of next 12 to 18 months as well. Good. Well, I didn't know that, but if you know you know what I'm going to say, if you need anything, let us know because I can, I course, can probably mate. help you. Yeah, yeah absolutely, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, with a, when, you know, like when you were starting your podcast and also because you've got a fairly powerful, I'm going to call it, social media following. Silly. Um, I think it's a silly... Well, there's nothing with the following. It's the flipping what I'm putting out there that I question sometimes, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, well, you've got what have you got now? About thirty odd thousand followers on Twitter. Um, I think it's thirty-five. Thirty-five thousand. Not too bad, you know. I feel like I'm right. Um, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Pulling the strings there, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. So, how, you know, like, because obviously, you, you did that just didn't happen overnight, and your podcast it didn't just happen overnight. What were the kind of early lessons that you learned while you were going through that process of building your own social media platform? you know, to, to put your content out through and also creating the content. Is there any, like, kind of little bits of the kind of this didn't go so well? Or, I, I don't like things yeah, to yeah. be no, too no, no, positive no. when I talk to people because it no, makes no. it seem like oh, the journey is okay. easy when it's not, you know. No, no. So um, it, it's having an idea of how I want it to sound. And I never thought I would get 3,000 followers, never mind 35,000. I, I never put a... Um, a limit on it or a, you know I, have yeah. a target, I don't have a target in mind so if, when people say to me you've got followers it's not a case of oh, that was the target and the plan it's obviously nice to have people that, that follow you and have an interest in what you're saying but my yeah. idea when I started was um, to have a voice and an opinion and I think where I was lucky is that I had a unique opinion 
or, 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 or I had quite a strong view on United, should we say. Maybe not unique, the wrong word, but a strong, <clears throat> yeah. strong view on United. And then when I got picked up with Sky and Sky News and, and, and Sky Bet and people are sporting life, and then obviously they yeah. hear in the sun and things like that, then more people heard the, the voice. And that's where the, the I guess, the, the, the following came from. But I think that it is caused, not as much now, but a bit older now, but initially in the early stages, some of the abuse was just like, Absolutely ridiculous. It was, you know, I've had the police involved in two occasions. Oh, really? I didn't know threatening, that. Threatening uh, children. I've got two boys. And oh, in yeah. the early stage, about 2015, 2016, there's a guy I won't mention his name based out in Southport. And he was threatening to come around and do all sorts. He found me on Facebook and, and through different links, he found sort of family ties. And, and when it gets like that, you can be as, you know, as, as, as strong and mentally as you like. But it, it does get to you, especially when you're yourself with kids and things. So, it hasn't always been uh, plain sailing. And I've tweeted things before that editors have run me and said, "What? Why have you written that? Not because we wanted to remove it, but what's your thought process behind that? Why do you think that's important?" And I always think the same thing with and, and the answer I've always given to them. I think I hope it comes through when I do tweet and posting. But I've always gone, I've always been that I would never tweet anything that I wouldn't say to anybody's face. And I don't mean yeah. that. I don't mean that. I look at me, I'm hard or anything. Not that far from it. I just think that if you were to tweet something. Would you say that if you somebody walked past you in the street and say that? And I probably would. I'm pretty sure I would. There might be the odd tweet, um, but yeah, in general, that's the kind of rule I've done. So yeah, growing the social following is good. Having a strong opinion, um, being linked to sort of the the places I work to sell. But one of the main key things I always say is listening and listening to what people are doing online and how they're behaving and how they're telling stories and what you think they might want to hear as well. It's not having an opinion, but if you're talking to somebody in the street or at work and they're not listening to you, then the conversation dies. Do you find yeah. it do you find it difficult to talk about other clubs in the same way asked, that you do about United? Cause... I was asked in May, I think it was here, May, June, to write um, for quite a, a well-known place uh, about Tottenham Hotspur and cover them. And they asked me to do it. And initially I was... I thought this could be good, this could be good, you know, a bit of more of a balanced view, perhaps Tottenham's on my team. But in the end, I said no, because I, I don't think I could bring myself to write about other clubs. I like to pick the bones out of games when I'm watching other teams play. So Arsenal at the moment spring to mind, defending and just doing the basics. Talk about Roy Keane talks about the basics all the time and getting it wrong. I just think it's a dying art at the moment, defending crosses, tracking your runner helping your teammate out, covering. I think Scott McTominay was brilliant for United the other night against Chelsea. Yeah, he was, yeah. Williams was bombing on and he was he recognised that there was gaps in behind and he was doing that. And I just think there's too many players today that are blessed with incredible ability, um, great, great players, but a lot of them don't like doing the dirty work. And I think that's what Solskjaer's trying to instill at United. But I see, see teams like Arsenal at the moment, Spurs have had it recently, um, and there's other teams as well, that they just don't defend properly or don't work as a team or don't put, I guess I don't like saying it, it's a bit of a cliche, but they're not putting a shift in. And I think yeah, it's so which easy is to blame unforgivable. somebody else. Yeah, completely. So easy to blame somebody else. But I think I think what's happened over time, um, especially from the content that I'm consuming, because I, I, obviously I'm like most other people, I'm on my phone quite a bit, but um, yeah. the I, uh, I started getting the train so mm-hmm. I get the train, it's about 40 minutes or something like that. Um, when, it, you know, morning and then evening. And I just spend the majority of my time listening to podcasts and consuming content now. Whereas yeah. before, when I was driving in my car, I didn't really consume as much. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it's like a little ritual that I've got where I'm listening to, you know, I'm listening to different content and how it's changed over time. And no, I do good. listen to people when they're talking about other clubs or they might, you know, they might be like general, like chief sports writer or whatever it might be. And I think they give a really good rounded view, but I actually prefer to listen to fans talk about my club. Yeah. Um, because I think that you've got a shared, you can be, I think, I think your own fans are a lot more um, honest, you know, whereas pundits sometimes don't want to piss off the actual fans themselves. Uh-huh. Whereas if if it's your, if it's my club, if I'm talking about United and I think that, you know, Fred, shouldn't be shouldn't be a starting player for United or whatever that might be. That's my opinion and I'm I'm entitled to that. Whereas I think some journalists sometimes sit on the fence when they're doing pieces or they do like tactical wording around how they talk about it. Whereas mm-hmm. if it's fan generated content, I actually 
prefer to consume that myself. More real, yeah. Yeah. Are you what? So, what's your take on the fan generated stuff versus the more kind of mainstream media I think outlets? It's, I, think, I think a lot of it's very good. I think there's some there's some bad ones, some good ones. I think in the, in the main, it's very good, and I think it's uh, not now, but initially, I think it came in as a bit of an eye opener to the mainstream media because it's the kind of output that you know they don't offer this fan. They do a little bit, but in general, it's not. They don't. They don't touch it. It's not very good. I think if you went onto one of the, the, the fan channels and had a look at the views they get after a game or in the build up to a game, it's hundreds, yeah. and hundreds of thousands. In some cases, they're often millions. So there's definitely a yeah. market for it. And I've been speaking to a couple of people actually at News. You a good point you made because I've been speaking to some people at a News Network. I won't say which is not a sport one, and there is concern amongst them that these sort of YouTube personalities. Um, in many ways, people are going there not for their news as much, but to, like you say, consume content because they can get it out a lot quicker. It's a lot rawer. It's a lot often from the heart. It's fair enough. It might be biased in one direction or the other, but actually, the viewing figures on your news channels or your sport channels, I know for a fact, in the main, are going down. I think. Yeah, because and people. It's... Are, it's the same as newspapers. If you pick up a um, a newspaper tomorrow, you probably you know, I guess you're like me, you've probably found out or read a majority of it the day before on, on your phone, either through, through Twitter or something. So why would you buy a newspaper tomorrow when you just got it now? Now, I, I do try and buy a newspaper each day just because, coming from the industry, I know how important it is, and I do like to, to read the newspaper because it's it's too easy to get your content from your phone, which is I do it every day, and I'll do it this afternoon, this evening, or whatever. But actually, just go and buy a newspaper because the work that's gone into it He's almost, I wouldn't say proper journalism, it's more old school journalism now. He's dying, yeah. you know, he's dying. Um, so, yeah, to go back to the question, yeah, I think the, I think initially it was a, an eye opener. I think there was a bit of, I wouldn't say arrogance around it, but I think the thought that these sort of YouTube channels and these sort of fan based content and, and, and output would, would die. But for, for me, I think um, we're going to see a change in the next two years and an introduction or more of an introduction to how these guys are, I wouldn't say presented on, on sort of your, your terrestrial channels, but I think there needs to be an awareness that they're there and maybe working together a little bit better is what, what I want to say. How that works, I'm not sure, but that's that's the way it's heading, I think. Let's it's do this I'll be... give you an example. I'll give you, sorry, I'll give you a quick example. Yeah, I went on. to, I went, when I did the guest lecture at Falmouth University last week, I spoke to the guy, they were all in there, there was two mix of boys and girls, 21, 22 years old, the oldest one in there. And they said to me that they love things like full-time Devils in the United stand um, because they, these guys have developed into characters and they relate to them and it's funny. And they just, they, they, you know, one of the guys, dad's in the lecture, he said, oh, I got to text up my dad last night. And he said, well, what, I said, what did he say? He said, can't wait for Arsenal fan TV later to see what Robbie's saying or DT or one of those guys off that are saying. And that's where a lot of people are going now. They'd rather hear that than see what Graham Sooners has got to say, sat in his studio, you know? Yeah, and uh, don't get me wrong. I think there's still a there's still a market for the, you know, Roy Keane, Gary of Neville, course, Jamie and Carragher, all that stuff. And I, I actually think Sky have done a great job in evil. You know, the evolution of their model now. They spend as much time sitting down, yeah. getting people's expert opinion on it, and then publishing that content through YouTube and through you Twitter and everything day, else. Though, no, you can't. And I think that's the thing that they've not got. They've not got the absolute specificity on that club itself that was a mouthful yeah. um and what they don't have or what they've only just come into the party with is when they're building their ecosystem of content where they push channels out they want everyone to go to skysports.com the bbc they want everyone to go to bbc mm. modern day c- content consumers i can't be bothered i want to view it on the youtube you know my youtube stream where i'm scrolling through my youtube channels because i watch youtube every single day or I want to see it on my Twitter feed, on my Instagram feed, on my Facebook feed. I don't want to go to the website. So therefore, it's had to. I think it's it's been a wrestling match, but I don't think it's a wrestling match that they can win. People don't want to visit websites. They don't want to pay for the Sky subscription. Yeah. But I still want to consume your good content. Give of me your good I content, mean, but I don't want to. Pay, you know, I don't want to pay yeah, for it almost, King, and I don't want to pay for it for Roy whatever King, reason. Neville soon as that. I mean, that is absolutely box <clears> office. I don't. There's, there's very little for me that can compete that from. Analysis Absolutely. Of the game, super Carrigan Neville on Monday Night Football are taken yeah. to a completely different level. But you talk about 
getting things for free. I think one in one of the Asian leagues, I'll say the Chinese leagues, I think it's the Chinese, but certainly one of the Asian leagues, they have a, a pay per game system. So you'd have a season ticket. So it'd be a pound to watch, I don't know, United if you yeah. had this model in and it'd go through Amazon. And I think that's the way we'll eventually go, we go because you said it there about spending money and paying your BT, your Sky subscription, whatever. It can get expensive. So actually, if you could just pay to watch the matches you wanted for 50p or a pound or a pound 50 or a couple of quid or whatever. Or buy yeah. United games on a match by match basis. Yeah, it'll probably still work out cheaper than having a they reckon, package over the season. They reckon that's the way it's going to go. Amazon and Facebook, you know, Facebook Watch that product that they've created. They they basically want to they're creating products to to rival um, YouTube essentially. And um, what they're trying to do now is they're trying to get the rights off them, but there's there's a reluctance to it because it's just it's so frustrating that as a United fan who's from Salford, my whole family's from like Salford area. We used to walk to the ground and, you know, still do when I go with my dad, walk to, walk to the Stratford end. And I can't watch the games for United, but if I'm in the Philippines, I can watch every single fucking game. And it's like, what the fuck? How was yeah. this, this even, right? There are, you know, not everyone can afford to go to the game. And I understand that we need to protect the actual crowds that are going in there. But football is such, there's such an appetite for football that I should be able to watch every single United under 21s, youth team, you know, under 18s, under 23s, and then also, you know, see the first team play every single game if I want to, and I can, I'll pay. I'll pay for that. When you pay, your, when you pay, your, when you pay your Sky subscription, obviously, I'm also paying for, you know, watching um, the other lot, other side of Manchester, and also them <laughs> Scousers. And, and don't be wrong. Fair enough, they are they are absolutely you know on top at the moment, and some of the football that's coming out is unbelievable, but. If I had the choice to just watch United all the time, I probably would. You know, I, if I could just watch every single United game, I'd sacrifice that. Of over course, you're sport, aren't you? Yeah. Wolves versus Aston Villa or whatever. And don't get me wrong, I do like watching. I, I'm a general football fan, but specific to my club. And I think that's where these fan generated content comes in. I, I um, listen and watch uh, Stephen Housen, you know, the guy from, mm-hmm. I think he's on Full Time Devils, but he's also got his own, his own yeah. stuff as well. And to be fair, he just talked like he was sat around at the pub having a beer, and that's yeah. kind of the content that um, you know that I want to consume. Um, but I do, like you said, the mainstream media stuff. I think Sky have done a great job. I think BT have stepped up as well. They did bring a different dimension with Rio and and, and a couple of other things that they've done. Um, Robbie Savage being controversial, and then you've got you know, the, the online content, but from a digital, you know, putting my digital hat on, why is it going like this? Well, the two, re- the two main drivers for this change is everyone's walking around with a mobile phone in their hand, pretty much mm-hmm. looking at it all the time. The bloke today literally nearly walked in the street. It, you know, like he was walking towards me, like there was a bus coming behind me. I was like, look, mate, you're going to get run over. Here. <laughs> and he was just looking at his phone, walking down the street, like a fucking zombie or something. He had the loop of Rashford's goal. Was... Yeah. Mate, and he was just like, nice. Uh, and then the other, the other thing is, all of these brands and businesses, and I know this because I've met Sky. I had a meeting with Sky about two months ago. Mm-hmm. They have this ecosystem, and they're trying to build their audiences all the time. If you build an audience through YouTube or Instagram or Twitter or any of these social media platforms, they've got your data. They can target ads towards you, or they can you know, monetize those views. And that's the reason why all of this is kind of growing from a – publisher perspective and um, the content con- consuming side of things is mainly around mobile phones you know iphones and whatnot yeah but yeah. a lot of people are, are now cottoning on to the, the how you can monetize it and how you can actually you know target audiences so i think that's that's kind of a perfect storm into where it's going it'd be really interesting to see how it develops over time as well because you have got the you know like the athletic popping up yeah um, uh, yeah. The coach's voice, obviously, we worked with the coach's voice to launch the coach's voice originally, um, which was a different angle to the athletic. But the athletic seemed to have pretty much signed up everyone. Are like, have they given you a bell yet? Or <laughs> no, I, you know what? I've not had that call yet. But I've always said this. I, Maybe I after this podcast, mate. You know, mate, honestly, I'm going to get you need to come on the United End podcast. Actually, I knew you could talk. <laughs> but this is different level. Um, <laughs> I no, I haven't, and it would be something that. I, I've never had in my mind, again, to be the social following. I'm not saying that I wouldn't mind to be asking because obviously people would like to, but I wouldn't... I'm a bit... About these paywalls, I'm a bit... I've tweeted about them. I think that journalism, yes, people need to be paid, and, but I think that 
while what the content's been good on Athletic, I wouldn't want it to go down the content for content's sake route. Does that make yes. sense? And I know yeah, it's not doing. Mean. I know it's not doing that at the moment, and I know it's not. But I've just um, and I do <laughs> I do subscribe to it. It's excellent, and all the all the all the very best are in there. So if you don't do do subscribe, but yeah, for me, I'd, I I hope it doesn't go. There's a couple of things that I've seen, and I'm thinking. I hope you don't go any further than that because then I think it ruins it. Less is more, Paul, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's a step. Well, it's a step towards it, isn't it? But the, I think so. I think they've got. To, I think the way that that is working now, putting it behind a paywall, it's like Audible. You know, um, the Amazon yeah. product. It's giving you a choice essentially. On the one hand, you're going to get a load of ads targeted towards you. And, you know, you're going to, you know, your phone and, you know, you scroll through your phone at the moment. It's something mm-hmm. like if you post something on Facebook, only like 0.5% of your actual audience sees it right. because there's that many ads in your feed. <clears throat> and Instagram's even smarter because you can't even tell that there are ads in your feed. You just scroll through. It looks like a normal post and you click yeah. on it and you're like, oh, shit, it's an ad. Whereas that ad world, to be honest with you, and I work in this space as a consumer – it's getting busy. It's getting messy. It's too much. There's too many ads being targeted out to people, and it's too mm. evasive based on what's going on from a data standpoint. I think Facebook and Instagram are definitely the drivers of that, um, mm-hmm. you know, in their platforms. And the flip side to that is that you can actually consume as much content as you want ad free. Now, yeah, people are tempted. You know, the athletic. I do understand why they're doing what they're doing. Because it's ad-free content, you know, there aren't banners everywhere and all that other stuff. It's more of a subscription model where if I know that I'm subscribing to Just United content and it means that I'm not going to get a load of ads about whatever, you know, ASOS or whatever it is. You know, when you're be. watching uh, YouTube, do you, do you, when you're watching a YouTube video, do you press skip ad? I'm not assuming you don't watch the ad, do you? No, no. I, obviously, because I know what goes on behind the scenes there, but, you know, that's a, what's known as a bumper ad. Um, and yeah, we, we run those ads for clients, but I generally do skip the ads unless it's something that I'm interested in. Like they might put a movie trailer on. Um, I don't stick around for good old, what's his name on three, six, five Ray Winston. I don't stick around for him. <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard the same shit. Over, over again from that guy. But are, they no, still I, wheeling, are they still wheeling around on that? I don't know. I think they've just still got the same old recordings from like three right. years ago. The, the few brands that I will look at though is like Paddy Power where they've actually yes. approached it in a different way and they've got like a WWE wrestler going over to Japan or whatever, you know, like that that kind of stuff yeah. is really Well, the Huddersfield Town thing was good, wasn't it? Oh, mate, that was genius. Absolute genius, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's 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 interesting to see where it's going to go over time because taking it from your angle, taking it from my angle, obviously it kind of meets in the middle, doesn't it? Uh-huh. And, and how people are consuming it. So, um, speaking of um, plugging things... Talk, tell me about your book. <laughs> hey, that was safe. You've done this before, haven't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. In, what is it? England Quest for Glory? It's called England Quest for Glory. So if you go on Amazon and type in my name or England Quest for Glory there, it's, you, can, uh, you can order the book. But be, this actually ties in what I was saying. So I'm happy not to talk about that. But the actual how it came about came from a discussion I had over Twitter about the English football team. So about... Two and a half years ago, I was talking to somebody on Twitter in the open. It was wasn't a direct message. It was just a discussion. And it was about this time of year, actually, when a, um international break was moving. I, was, I think I was tweeting something like, the international break, room momentum. And to be honest, I feel a bit disconnected from the English team. Yeah, and then, yeah. Was this pre-Southgate? Yeah, I think it was, actually, yeah. Um, and just got, got talking to publishers via that one tweet online. Speaking about how, why you've disconnected, why what are the issues that you think are disconnected? And obviously, you get into the team then and think, will we ever win a trophy? You see, like the Ashes, England, or hopefully the don't know when you're going to be listening to this, but hopefully England will win the Rugby World Cup on Saturday. Such one. Um, you have these other sports, athlete, athletes, um, rowers, Olympians, and you have these periods where they have dips, but they come back and win something and they're successful. And we just never have seemed to do that. 2018 World Cup semi-final. Well, before that, we got to a semi-final in 1990. It's meant to be the home of football. So Are you not counting you can... Le Tour Noir? Le Tour Noir, mate. 1997. <laughs> Is it 97, that? Yeah. That's one for somebody, mate. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if you've got any listeners, <laughs> check out Paul Scholes's, talk about YouTube, get Scholes's performance against Italy in Le Tour Noir. 
some of his balls, one to Ian Wright was absolutely exceptional. Yeah. But yeah, so in general, though, we don't do well, do we? What I'm saying, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is we don't, we don't do well. So the book, the idea yeah. came from behind that, and then it covers sort of 1990. So Paul Parker's in the, Alan Shearer's in the, so Matt nice. Pinson's in there because he's an Olympian uh, and he had success. Michael Vaughan, led England to Ashes success. You've got Michael Owen in there. Uh, Gerard Houllier because of Claire Fontaine. So they're very, that was like St George's Park. So ten years ago, France won the World Cup in 1998. They opened. Yeah. Their equivalent, which was Claire Fontaine. Yep. And you got people through like Henri Trezeguet, and now you're seeing the latest wave, which is Mbappe, Pogba, yeah. the world champions. So there, was, there was a big, there was a lot made around that at the time, wasn't there? Uh, Lillian Taram and um, Petit Vieira. Then you had, was it Trezeguet and all Wonderful sorts. Team. Yeah, the, it was. It was quite. I always look back and say, what would Lillian Taram be worth in the modern day transfer <laughs> market? You know, you know. Christ. He was a beast, wasn't he? He could he he, he could do everything. Yeah. yeah, it's it's funny when you look back at that England and and how they've not actually, you know, why they've not done it. I do like what Southgate's doing. What's your ta- what's your take on Southgate? There's something called the DNA English DNA, which the sort of the um, gets in the book the the youth teams. So they won the two on tournament. One of them have won the World Cup. Paul Simpson was a manager. Won the England World Cup a few years ago. Yeah, they have, a, they have a specific style and way of playing that fits the players. And I think what we're seeing now with St George's Park and what Southgate's doing, that we are, that they kind of hit, I, I think, the top of where they can go. It's how they break through that now and really develop that winning mentality and winning tournament mentality. I think it was 2002, I think it was, Rafa Honigstein, the German journalist, told me that Germany got to the final of the World Cup and they lost to uh, Brazil. Can you remember the, the, the Ronaldo? Yeah, Ronaldo, Ronaldo yeah. Ronaldo scored. He scored a hat-trick or I think he scored two. It was two, wasn't it? And, yeah. Um, he, they realised they got to the final, but they realised how poor they were and the infrastructure and the grassroots. There was no real good players coming through. and Well, there was, but they needed to do some work with them. So they had Schweinsteiger, Ozil, uh, Thomas Muller, that kind of era were coming through. And then not the next World Cup, but I think the one after that, they won it. And the basic what I'm saying is there was a plan and they tailored everything to winning a yeah. World Cup. And I yeah. think we're at that point where we've got all the plan in place, we've tailored it, but I don't think that we are playing in a way that suits the players. So this pressing and passing out from the game, uh, out from the back rather, is very Latin American, very Spanish as well. Whereas if you look at the German way of winning things, they realise they can play like that and adopted sort of like a South American way of like quite robust and physical. They were all very good footballers and comfortable on the ball. And I just feel at the point I guess I'm trying to make is that England can't play the way that Spain played, can't play the way that Germany played. Correct. But if it is getting wide 4-4-2 or 4-3-3 and being dynamic and getting in the opposition's face, but then having that quality on the ball, that freedom to express yourself in that final third, and I think that's what we should do. I don't think we should... I feel that sometimes as much as we've improved and as good as we are at the moment and we, it's probably the best we've been since 1990. I we're think not, so. We're not playing the English way, I don't think. No, I, I think... I think... Say what is the English way, but I spoke to a guy called Dan Abrams in the book and he said, when you're, when you're abroad, or if you're in Brazil, for example, they play football how they dance. So very artistic, very creative. They, they, they do turns, they, they, you know, they're throwing shapes, one of the better, better word. You give an Englishman a ball in the final third, and it's hit it, get rid of it. They feel under pressure. They clam up. You can see that against the top opposition. I don't mean teams that you can beat six or seven past like Panama or whoever it was. I would like at the top level, England players are gripped by a fear almost. And we need to get out of that. You know, I always go back to that funny Peter Kay advert that we all laugh when he goes, have it. Well, that's yeah, football. Yeah, yeah. Have it, get amongst them, hit them, uh, hit them early, let them know you're there early doors, that kind of thing. There's a line yeah. in Xavi or Iniesta's book when they play in Liverpool. I'll say Xavi, it probably isn't, but it's a Spanish, a Spanish player, I forget who it is now, and they're playing Liverpool in the Champions League at Anfield, and in the first minute, one of the Liverpool players goes through with a Barcelona player, wins the ball, good clean challenge, the ball goes out for a Barcelona throw-in, the cop rises and cheers like scored a goal, and they're yeah. saying, Xavi and Iniesta are looking at each other going, they've just, they've just given us the ball back. And yeah, they're yeah, yeah. They're cheering, they're cheering like they've scored a goal, but they've just given us the ball back, and now we're in yeah. possession. Yeah, exactly. Kind of that's why they do work. the damage. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's interesting how it how it goes forward because you've got obviously you've got Kane, Sterling, 
Santo Rashford. You you've got you you do have the basis of of something good there. I think you're right. I think we need to play a modern day Premier League style. And I think quick. that would actually, you know, quick, um, physical and I think that is how obviously the most successful teams in, in yeah. Europe are playing at the moment. So I think that's again, you gotta have the, the personnel to do it. So yeah. No, I agree. I think you're right. And I think that listen, Gareth Southgate Part one of his job was superb. He reconnected in many ways the English public with the national team. That disillusionment that I talked about at the beginning of the question, it seems to have gone. I think we all felt um, a lot closer to the team. We all felt there was the whole country last year. It felt like, you know, it felt like we could do something and there was a bigger belief there and people enjoyed watching the team. They wanted to turn on the TV and watch England. Whereas, yeah. A lot of these qualifying campaigns, you, you know, you do lose a bit of momentum and interest. In, and often England breeze through these tournaments, these, these qualifying campaigns, and then let us down at the, you know, at the tournament stage. But he seems to have turned the corner. The challenge now is taking it on and doing something that uh, hasn't been done since 1966 in Sir Alf Ramsey and win, winning a trophy, I think. So, obviously, we'll be talking about your book there, available on Amazon for <laughs> England. Yeah, right. yeah, I think, I think. It's it's a good read for any Englishman, um, any obviously anybody that likes football as well. I think it's a good read. Uh, with regards to um, books, do do you like? Have you? Is there a certain book or a piece of content or anything like that that you've gifted the most to other people? Just talk about books. Is it great? Right. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I, the reason the NFL thing, and I wasn't saying that to to, to strike a debate. It was a genuine point for me, and that's why I was genuinely interested in what you had to say about it, because I don't listen to a lot of football podcasts. What I listen to is, it could be something from the Gimler group, it could be Heavyweight, it could be Reply All, it could be Joe Rogan, which you and I talked about before we started recording. It could be a true crime thing. It could be, I listened to one about how the how they captured Bin Laden um, a few years ago, the other week, because I'm interested in different ways of presenting content and knowledge and learning different ways of doing things and, and from a production point of view, what does it sound like? Yeah. I'll never forget, and I'm sure many of you listeners have heard <laughs> it, S-Town, Start to S-Town, um, which if you haven't listened to it, for me is a must listen. And if you just listen I've to that, that, it is. Have you, have you listened to it? No, I've not listened to it. I'll take a get, I'll get take listen to it. Get, get S-Town on, tonight on your way home and give me a text after you've started listening to it because you won't be able yeah. to stop listening to it. The beginning of it, it just grabs you and it's a clock and it's about a clock. And if you had said to me, Tom, this is his podcast, it's, Starts with a clock or talk about a clock. <laughs> I'd be like, "What, well, mate? I'm not going to listen to that." That's not, but je- je- it's nothing to do with a clock, by the way. It's it's a true yeah. crime thing with a twist yeah. in the middle, and it's things like that from a production point of view. Um, How they're approaching asking, it? Yeah, what yeah. are they doing? Is it a bit raw, like we said at the, at the beginning? Is it very well scripted? Is it? You know, I've listened to Ricky Gervais on a few um, podcasts because he was trending this morning, so. I don't know what happened. We run our sub Ricky Gervais on, and I know what he did, and the way people questioned him, and the way he speaks about how he consumes content. So yeah. I guess the point of the matter thing is, learn as much as you can with what you do. Yeah. And if it is podcasting, like what you're doing, listen to different things and different ways of, of doing things, and that's what I think is where you pick up things and learn. So definitely, yeah, definitely, definitely podcast mate is, is is a huge is a huge thing. On the Joe Rogan thing, so I've, I'm obviously a lot of my inspiration for actually do something on my own is actually him. Um, mm-hmm. I do listen to his stuff, and I was listening. I'm on there to tomorrow, on... actually. Oh, really? I don't, I don't reckon <laughs> oh, he's going to get no, as many. He's good, he's good mate. It's not get as many yeah. view... listens as this one. Um, no, no, but, yeah. well, he, 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 he I listened to him last him. week. The command, the commander who saw the UFO. Did you listen to that one? Yeah, mate. It's that stuff like different. that. I'm dead <laughs> interested. Like there was another one I was listening about quantum mechanics and I was it was just like blowing my mind and there's a guy called uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson who's just like yeah yeah, yeah. like that guy he's like got like smooth New York cool voice but he's talking about astrophysics and it's like <laughs> I never thought I'd be sat there listening to it but I'm just like this guy's cool like this the is worst really one you cool. pull up in a car you've got a podcast on you can't get out because you want to listen to the end of it yeah exactly yeah um in terms of like. You know when when you you kind of working in in the industry and and who who are the kind of main people apart from me uh, that you look up to of in the course. industry? <laughs> you mean from a sporting point of view? Yeah, well, any point of view, mate, because you you touch both business and sport. But I think respecting the craft of what you do, who are the people where you think you know, wow, that you know, they're really on top of the game, kind of thing. 
I like Henry Winter a lot, and that sounds like a, an obvious um, one to to, uh, to to name because everybody knows who, who he is. I do like the guys that have gone to the Athletic, but one of the ones that was sort of really good to me at the beginning and took time and explained to me how he would present different types of content is a guy called Gabriel Marcotti, who you might have seen on ESPN. He's the American sound. Oh, mate, I love that guy. Name. And I he's... remember him being on, was he on Channel 4 Football Gazetta back in the day? When, I'm, not sure, like... I'm not sure if he was there. That was James Richardson. Oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure they had another expert. Well, no, I, I've, I've heard him you speak. Know about he him, always, you know? Yeah, he absolutely speaks with, because he's got an American accent, but he's got a real yeah. strong knowledge of European football, hasn't That's he? it. And his take on it, on take of things, is what I was talking about being unique and how he describes things. Yes, it's yeah. so a way you want to, to listen. The best broadcaster who I would pick up, well, not pick up, but listen to now if I could, or type into YouTube or listen to him, is a guy called Danny Kelly, who's on TalkSport. Yeah, I love Danny Kelly, yeah. And Danny He's Kelly, good. for me, is incredible as a producer, um, presenter, commentator. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't mean commentator, I think commentator in games, it's just the way how he describes and, and provides yeah. information. And his knowledge of, you talk about understanding other teams and getting to the crux of the matter. If I wanted somebody to interview somebody who from, you know, decades ago is no longer with us or in any in any walk of life it, I'd, I'd want him there because he gets the right questions and again it comes down to being unique what he's doing and how he does it isn't from a script but it works for him and for me if i could if i could sit down with anyone and have a breeze afternoon it'd probably probably be him actually good good yeah no to finish with i do listen to him on talk sport and i do think because what he's often there he's often there with a Genius. someone else who's been in the industry yeah. and the professionalism that he that he has to put in the time and effort to find out as much as he does as his guest because he he's, yeah. he's often on with Simon Jordan, isn't he? That's right. Yeah, so him and Simon Jordan, but he's done his research on Jordan, so he he, he pulls out, digs out some of the skeletons in his closet. I'm sure he's got a few, um, but it's good, <laughs> just good. He, um, yeah, I, I I completely agree with that. It's a good uh, kind of point of reference. Um, so. Last couple of questions now, mate, before we try and yeah, give some people advice. Um, if you could interview anyone in the current world of sport, who would it be and what would you ask them? Active sportsman or woman, uh, sportsman or woman? I would, obviously, we know a lot about Ronaldo because of how he is and he, he did an interview with Piers Morgan not so long ago. I thought it was interesting, but I'd love to speak to Lionel Messi because there's two really, Lionel Messi because we know he's a genius, but we don't know enough about his mentality. We can guess yeah. what his menta- we can guess what his mentality is. We can talk to him about his great goals and his incredible skill and how him being the greatest ever or whatever. But actually, what is going on inside that brain? How how does he maintain that level so consistently? And just how does he? Yeah, because he what, barely gets he injured, stop? doesn't he? That's the thing about Ronaldo and Messi that a lot. Of, don't be wrong; the numbers are ridiculous, but. Mm. They, they're there, they turn up, he plays every game. He literally yeah. plays every game. They don't rest him. It's definitely him, mate. And then I don't know enough about the sport, but again, it goes down to mentality. And I'd love to know, talk to uh, Tiger Woods about his sort of return to, to greatness, if you like, you, you know, the other year, when he, the other month, what it was, he won, you know, another major, didn't he? Did he? I think he did. Didn't yeah, he? it was last and, year. I think he yeah, won the US last Open year. last year. And, and just that, and I watched it in, in kind of, not disbelief, but I was always willing him on myself because obviously he's made some sort of catastrophic errors in his life, but everybody had written him off as well. Yeah. And I think we shouldn't underestimate how that, the ego, how that hurts their ego, but it's one thing being able to say you can do it, but then to come back when he looked out, out of it, I mean, two years ago, if we were talking, you probably feared that he'd never win one again, I'd, I'd imagine, or that's the sort of the feeling I got from certain people. Yeah. And to come back and do that. It's his back, it was his back injury, wasn't it? He's, but he basically, yeah. every time he hits the ball, he's in, he's in excruciating pain. So the fact that he got through that pain barrier and actually achieved that, I think everyone was kind of willing him on because he was a bit like an animal that had gone into yeah. captivity, you know. You almost want to see him getting back to those heights and those levels that he was at before. So I think um, culture, culture in sport as well is important. I know this isn't an individual, but to answer the question, Lionel Messi, definitely just the mentality of the man. And obviously somebody like Tiger Woods, who has, has come back, not from the dead, but you know, has come back against you know, great adversity to, to propel himself back. 
I'd love to know what really, I don't want to say makes him tick, but how you prepare for that in your mind. And then yeah. the, third, the, third, the third thing, he's not, he's not a person, but he's, he's developing a culture and fostering that sort of team ethic. So, you know, you, you go and win something as a team. And I just think that's amazing how you can do it. Yes, you've got to have the best players, but as we know, you don't always have, just because you've got the best players doesn't I mean you've got the best team. And I think that's interesting as well. Yeah, definitely. And just a, as a kind of a, a follow-up to that, if you could interview anybody in the history of sport, one person in the history of sport, who would it be and what would you ask them? Oh. You'd so we've said present like past. Muhammad Ali, wouldn't you? Because he was unique and he did it with this, 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 a lot of this talks about unique and, and, and content and storytelling and what makes Danny Kelly as a presenter. And I'm not comparing him to Muhammad Ali, but I like him because he's unique in what he does. Okay. Yeah, Muhammad absolutely. Ali had that kind of arrogance, you know, mouthy way about him, but he was like one of the first to do it. So what made him want to be like that to do it? What, what thought this is the way for me and I'm going to go in, I'm going to be the best ever in my sport. All that kind yeah. of, again, mentality around it. I'd just love to know why and what and, and how. And I think these guys are incredibly intelligent. I just, I just don't often feel we don't get enough out of them. And, and it, you know, when they're here sometimes, again, Tiger Woods as well, and who can blame him for not wanting to talk to the media, but people like that, it's their, not so much what they've done, it's how they got there in terms of what's going on in yeah. your brain. Because if you've got, you and I are in the kick around, and I tweak my knee or you pull your hamstring, you know you can't do it because you've hurt yourself. You know that's a fact. But actually, what's going on in between those ears and at the yeah. elite level with all that pressure and scrutiny, that's what that's what just, you know, I find so interesting. And, and then, but the one person, I, I, sorry, I'm obviously don't want to keep you, but the one person, Englishman, I would love to interview is Sir Bobby Robson. Because yes, that yeah. guy Good one. was just, you know, superb. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I'd love to just have a, have a beer with him and have a chat with him about how he approached things and, and everything else. I think when when you look back, I think English football does and will continue to look back at him as a real one-off, you know, in terms of the evolution of, of British football. Course, he was yeah. definitely a one-off. Well, I mean, you look at the Italian, for Italian 90, he was being hounded massively. They, the, the, the media were on him. I mean, yeah. it's Paul Parker and John Barnes and anyone like that who before that was, but he got dog's abuse. Yeah. Dog's abuse and came out of it as a gentleman. But it's not only that, the other element to me, he dealt with, he all brought through Ronaldo, he signed him from PSV to Barcelona, but also there was an interpreter there, you might have heard of him, a guy called Jose Mourinho. Never heard of him. So he had him as well, you know, it's little stories like that, and I just love that, you know, it never happened, but love the opportunity to speak to him about some of his stories, I, I found that quite fascinating as well. Right, okay. Well, um, Tom, we've, we've covered a lot, haven't we? We've been on for an hour, you know. Have we? An hour. Right, it didn't feel like it, mate. It was good, though. I enjoyed it. Do it again. Good. Good. I think we should do well, a United um, podcast next week if you fancy it. Let's do it. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm up for that. Good. Well, um, thank you very much for your time. And if anybody wants to, anybody that's not already following you, uh, you know, if you want to <laughs> plug your your handles, your social media, what where where can people find you? Yes, Natalie and Brulia doesn't follow me. Yet. If Natalie and Brulia would like to follow me, she'd be most welcome. Um, <laughs> My Twitter handle, yeah, twitter.com forward slash Mr. Tom McDermott. It's still, is it forward slash? Is that what you call it? Forward Mr. slash. Tom, Mr. Tom McDermott on Twitter. Mr. Tom McDermott. Okay. Um, and that's it, mate, yeah? Yeah, not T. Diddley, the not... Puppet Master, <laughs> I'm doing Papa that Mac. I'm doing that later, mate, actually. I'm playing five a side, so I'll be, yeah, I'll be pulling some strings. Oh. Without a doubt, mate. We need to get that going as well, actually, don't we? Oh, mate, you'll be running rings around me. Me, you and uh, Kenneth. Oh, Has he been to the gym, guy. by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be seeing him later, Kenneth Berkeley. Are you seeing him, are you? Yeah, he's got arms like I've got legs. Yeah, mate, they are something else, aren't they? Yeah. He went, well, he, he grew up going to... selfie on the choir. Yeah, he, he, well, he grew up going to the gym with uh, Danny Welbeck, didn't he? So uh, he's a big lad. Right. Thank you, mate. I really appreciate it. Top work, mate. Take care. Speak to you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Casey Digital Podcast. 
more podcasts to come in the future but i think that was a different angle um, and hopefully you got some value from it if you liked it please give me a couple of stars on the podcast review system leave a review uh, that's going to help it obviously grow a little bit um, and if you want to follow me on social media just search for casey digital or paul casey on linkedin um, and i'd be happy to connect with you if you want to get in touch give me a shout thanks very much cheers mm-hmm.